Hello and welcome to the second of our Nerve podcasts, Hope Beyond Brain Disease. I'm Lee Hatcher. This time, a condition in the brain that's likely to have the sufferer bouncing around between doctors and tests, trying to identify a series of unusual and worsening symptoms. When they finally get a diagnosis, it's a condition called PCA, posterior cortical atrophy. Joining me is Rowena Mobbs, a neurologist at Sydney Cognitive, and Richard and Cheryl, who will explain what it's like to live on that merry-go-round with PCA. First, Rowena explains what exactly is posterior cortical atrophy. I think it's one of the most fascinating, interesting types of dementias. It's very much a visual type of dementia. If we think about dementia, which is the umbrella term for a loss or degeneration of neurons within the brain, of which Alzheimer's is is a most common type, usually that would present with memory loss uh, and even mood disturbance often. But visual problems are are really common in PCA. And this is something that can greatly impact the person. It's, um, you know, for example, um, gestures or or dealing with um, objects in front of the person. And I think we'll hear described some of the difficulties with it. We we think it is probably a a form of Alzheimer's, though Mm. the jury is out. But the the pathology under the microscope is often similar. And it impacts this area of the brain called the occipital lobes. And they are where our our vision sits. Vision is within the brain. The neurons perceive vision. And it's a really large area of the brain. It is certainly a major part of our existence, of course, and we need our vision. And so that hence the large area of the brain being taken up. It is a rare condition and perhaps difficult for doctors to diagnose, recognise? Yes, so it is rare. And if if we classify it as a type of Alzheimer's, we think it's in the realm of about 5% of patients with Alzheimer's disease. Though, because of that factor of difficulty identifying this condition, it may be a higher number of patients, say 10 or 15% of Alzheimer's patients. But Often these patients will have seen many different doctors, right from the GP through to eye specialists for these very visual problems. And even as neurologists, we don't always get it right. We don't always detect it early enough. I'm sure we're going to hear that from Richard and Cheryl. Is there a cause? Yes, there's always a cause. The cause is life. So it's bound to be environment and genetics. And uh, to, to what degrees, we don't understand yet. It's bound to be complex, multiple different factors, um, pieces of that puzzle to cause the illness. But uh, as I alluded to, we think it's a type of Alzheimer's. And in that condition, um, they, we think there's a culprit protein called beta amyloid, largely, although there are others. And that may sort of clog up neurons or their connections and cause a dysfunction of the neurons. And eventually, um, those neurons can no longer cope and a loss of neurons. I'm so glad to say that Richard and Cheryl are here to tell us exactly what it's like living with PCA. Richard's a former private pilot, Justice of the Peace, still runs his own removalist company. Cheryl is a former nurse. So what and when did you both start to notice something different in Richard. Who was first? Richard, I suppose it was you. Well, I suppose about four or five years ago, I always had eyesight issues anyway, but I found it hard to drive at night time. And if it's raining and bad weather, I wouldn't drive at all. So I've been noticing slight de- deterioration for a long time. You've been married 43 years. Yes. I suspect, Cheryl, you probably knew something was different before Richard realised you realised, <laughs> if you know what I yes, mean. I think I did. It was... It was shaking of the head when he was trying to focus on something, a little bit of stumbling, and just that he'd been playing bridge, he couldn't see the cards properly, and he'd come home, he'd be all dejected. And we went to the optometrist, who we'd seen for many, many years prior, and over a couple of years' period, she made him three or four different pairs of glasses for bridge playing, for reading, for driving, for normal, everyday seeing. And um, then she finally said to me, Cheryl, this is not Rich's eyesight, it is a cognitive issue. So therefore, we went to the GP, spoke to her about things. She didn't do a lot at that point of time, and as Richard had glaucoma, was being treated for it, an eye specialist, I spoke to him on numerous occasions. He couldn't answer my questions, but he didn't tell me where to go. And I knew there was a problem, and I really thought Richard had a brain tumour, and I would have been happy if he'd had a a benign brain tumour to cause all these problems. See, that's interesting, because 
you're kind of after a tag, aren't you? Everything was all over the place. There wasn't a straight road in any of this. And I asked the eye specialist for an MRI. He sent us back to the GP who did it. And then we were referred to Dr. Mobs, which would have been in late 2014. So how long was this whole process from when these changes started to happen? The merry-go-round right. of doctors. The merry-go-round started in September 2014. We'd been to our specialist and we'd then just got to Dr. Mobs. Richard, how did you feel when you were finally diagnosed with PCA? Well, it's a bit of a shock in the beginning losing your driver's licence because I'd yeah. be driving for 55 years and suddenly you can't drive anymore. Or fly anymore. Or fly anymore because I got a pilot's license. It took me years to get one and suddenly you can't fly anymore. So it's not much you can do. You just have to adapt yourself to the situation. And fortunately, I discovered Uber and taxis. and Lots of ways around. A lot of ways around it. It's just uh, adapting. This may seem an unfeeling question to ask, but was it a good thing to finally get that tag, that diagnosis? Well, I suppose it is, because I thought it was just my glasses. I didn't think the optometrist was any good because she couldn't fix my glasses. And I'm telling her I couldn't see much. So, uh, you ended up having lots of glasses. Lots understand. of glasses, and uh, drove the lady insane. But uh, <laughs> you, know, you have to accept these things. I'm 72 nearly, so you know things happen. Cheryl? Throughout this process, Richard has always been in denial, despite what he's just said. And what he blamed his issues on, he was on hormone therapy for prostate cancer, and he's quite convinced that that is what has co- had caused the eyesight issues. Mm. A lot of this is denial on Richard's. I have to contradict him quite a lot because... He's such a bloke. Well, he is. I mean, Richard's on a different plane to all of us. He always has been, the most lateral person I've ever known. But, I mean, everybody loves him, and he's very intelligent. What would you say it was like for your relationship? through all this merry-go-round and all this uncertainty? Over the years, Richard would never go to a doctor. I always had a fight with him to have just normal checkups, or whatever. And I'd always go with him because he would lie to me <laughs> about the outcome. And I... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I've always been with him. But in the last 10-odd oh, years, he's been very, very good. But in the beginning with all this merry-go-round, he did buck the system and I have to be careful who I book in, when I book them in and how often. Now, the last 12 months, all that's eased a bit. Okay. It has eased, which makes life a lot easier. But someone said to me a few weeks ago, what do you do, Cheryl? And I said, well, I look after Richard. And she said, well, don't be so stupid. What else do you do? And it's the truth. I do. He's the most important person at the top of the tree, the people that I look after. And if you think about it, if he's lost a large part of his vision, that requires a lot of help and a lot of understanding. Well, it does. But I've always done a lot for Richard because he's been very lateral and not very handy in the home or practical, anything. So I've always had to do all those things. But I'm getting tired because I'm getting a bit older and there's a lot of other factors in our lives now. But we still have a good time. We think alike. We like the same things, generally. 43 years of marriage. Well, that's right. Richard, what's it been like for you personally and what's it been like with your relationship? Well, it's been a bit frustrating for me because now I have to listen to Cheryl all the time. (laughs) And Cheryl's the next nurse. Yes. I go from doctor to doctor. How helpful. And (laughs) I've never seen so many doctors in my life. So who am I seeing now? We've been together from the day we met. This is about 45 years ago. Yeah. From the day we saw each other, we've always been together. Rowena, what do you look for, what do you listen for to come up with a diagnosis of PCA? Yeah, so with neurological conditions, you always start with the history, and that includes not just from the patient. As we've heard, there can be lots of contributing um, history from family and friends. And uh, so we listen as doctors, first of all. We try to put uh, together some clues. And with PCA, there can be subtle, very slow changes and so you have to listen over time repeatedly see your patient and watch them over time and the classic things are perhaps a little bit of difficulty with numbers and letters so writing and then accounts adding up and interpreting numbers and letters there can be difficulty interpreting just normal social cues so somebody giving a thumbs up for example 
identifying that or, or with faces, sort of recognising people. And difficulty with visual tasks like dressing, putting on clothing, writing uh, and drawing uh, pictures, recognising uh, imagery on television or, or through IT, that can be really hard. Even as time goes on, difficulty with using a knife and fork or walking through a doorway can be very hard and, and that's really impairing. So this was on your radar as you were listening to Richard and Cheryl? Yes, so I guess in a way my, my job is, is easy here because he'd seen multiple eye doctors, including a neuro-ophthalmologist who's switched on to these conditions as well, and nothing had been identified, although he has a history of, of eye troubles, and they'd been treated as, as best they could. But it was more than that, and I, I always uh, have a radar for rare conditions and what's going on, is there something more, you know, that sort of investigation approach. And with Richard, I could see in front of me across the desk that he just wasn't holding the pen right or grabbing the pen right. And if he'd walked into my office, he just was missing those sort of trajectory lines as he's walking, you know, and I'd be worried if he was flying my plane, (laughs) to (laughs) be honest. I think I might say that too, Richard, I'm sorry. (laughs) So if you don't look, you don't find. And and I must observe the patient every time they walk in the door, right Mm. from the get-go. Richard, can I ask you, can you put into a form of words what it's like to have this condition? What's it like today for you? It's very frustrating. (laughs) Yeah, you also have to rely on other people to do things for you. I find it hard to read on the computer. Like, I can't even send an email. So all that is hard. All the things I used to do, I can't do anymore. Faces? Faces is the hard one. Recognising people... And when I go somewhere, people talk to me, and I don't know who they are. So you're looking at me. Yeah. Describe what I look like to you. Oh, I can see you quite clearly now, but you've got yeah. glasses. And, but maybe if you walk in next week, I won't recognise you. Wow. Cheryl, what's that like? What's that been like to live with? Oh, well, I suppose it is traumatic, and it, because it fluctuates so much, sometimes I think, well, am I a bit cooker here? I'm missing something. Or our family, our children don't know the depths of this you know I tell them things when we're going out you know watch your father take him here do that and then Richard always says to them oh don't worry I can see like a hawk that is what he says all the time and they think well you know what's Cheryl going on about if he can see like a hawk but then he's had a couple of falls in front of them and trips and things so they do know but they don't know the greater depth of it all what first happened we were at the club and her twin daughters were coming. Anyway, Richard went up to another table and there was a little girl there and he thought it was one of our twins and he was talking to her. Well, the little girl got upset and frightened yeah. and her mother was there and I thought that they thought he was, you know, not a very nice person. So I had to go up and explain the situation that he could not see who that person was but he, he really upset this child unintentionally and that I thought, my God, you know, but... Our twins are identical, and even I find it hard at times. Yeah. I know. And I always say, well, which one are you? So, <laughs> it, but, you know, they don't mind, and they know, and they're very helpful and supportive to their grandfather. But it's getting a little bit scary when you're out in the big world. If you're at home, it doesn't matter. Rowena, is there a treatment for PCA? What can you do for people in this position? The treatment and cure are two different things. Firstly, with treatment, we can try to um, treat classic Alzheimer's uh, in a way and sort of give a tablet, which largely is used for memory, and memory can be part of this condition. And so uh, the thing called cholinesterase inhibitors, and um, that can be helpful to a degree, but it doesn't slow down or or cure the condition, unfortunately. So then we're in the realm of management, and that's a huge topic and often a very under-recognised and I hesitate to say, but sometimes ignored topic for patients. So with management, um, again, it's sort of listening well and understanding their own circumstance individually as patients and families and then getting them to a point of care. So continuing that relationship and rapport and then getting them, I think, to people like occupational therapists who can go out to the home, have a look, 
check the environment and make modifications, not just as far as vision and falls goes, but cognitively, so how they can function well and think well in their own environment and then extending out to the community, say going to an ATM, being able to put in pins and so on. Supporting them through physiotherapy if there are mechanical arthritis sort of factors, etc. And sometimes the brain condition can affect movement. And other supports, you know, psychologically, because that's a, a huge part of treatment too. Yes. Shaping their expectations almost. Yes, partly. And also resolving stress because underlying stress in all of these conditions can make the symptoms worse and, and it makes, makes life very hard. You know, you're going through a lot already to deal with a condition let alone how the family's going to take it or financial consequences or whatever it is to yes. sort out. So sometimes seeing a clinical psychologist or a counsellor, psychotherapist can be helpful as well. Can I ask you a personal question sure. about these two, that they're up for talking about this? What do you think of that? <laughs> Pleasingly, my, my uh, patients uh, often surprise me with their talents and skills great. through yes, dementia, yes. Yeah. shock horror. So people are very good in different ways and they have intelligence in different ways, even though in some capacities they might be affected. So I think with Cheryl and Richard, um, e even today, you know, I'm o often hearing that talent, the different aspects of them as people. Often these days people are very switched on, you know. The old classic was we thought older people and people with dementia could not use IT. Well, that's certainly not the case. I don't have a single patient without an iPhone. <laughs> and they, they watch TV and they, they're in, engaged in the world and they've got lovely social groups often. And so, um, you know, that's a big part of the person's treat. They're still living life. They are it's living a big life. Point to make. <laughs> they have relationships. They're living life just as a, a well person would in, in lots of ways. So well done to you too. Richard and Cheryl, can I finish with this question? How are you dealing with this day to day and what's the future look like for you? Well, fortunately, I've got one big, um, I've got a lot of sense of humour <laughs> and I can always laugh. I take things by stride all the time. That's a uh, gift, actually. And you need that, otherwise yes. uh, it's a very humiliating when I crossed the road some time ago and this young girl grabbed me, but I'll take you across the road, she said. You know, you have to accept all these things. What a happy thing. And a lot of people are a lot worse off than I am, so yeah. I can't complain, really. Cheryl, what's the future look like for you? Well, now it's looking a lot brighter and uh, more settled when we know more, what to access, and just get on with life. The first thing Dr Mobbs ever said to us was get out there and enjoy your life, live your life. Well, we've done that. We travel. We've already had three cruises this year with another one coming up. Bravo. And the next year we've got one booked and the following January one booked, plus little things in between. Richard has always been a doer. I mean, he's been skydiving. He's abseiled off the Harbour Bridge. He's flown little planes. So I think thank God for all that because he's got all that to look back on. And we have got wonderful friends and they're all so supportive. Yeah. And we love living in our community so it is not that bad and we're just going to get on with life. And also got a fantastic atmosphere in the office. We've got an incredible culture. Yeah, good stuff. And everybody laughs and everybody's happy. And the trouble is I don't even recognise half the people who work for me anymore, especially the drivers. You don't see them that often. And I talk to them. I said, who are they? You know, No <laughs> idea who they are. But anyway, everybody knows me and we all laugh and a very supportive office. You're a magnificent couple. And... Great advocates, actually. I'm so pleased that you've been up for this podcast. What a great conversation. Thank you so much indeed. Oh, much. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is all up Richard's alley. <laughs> he thrives on it. And he'll be telling everybody for weeks about it. Spread the word, Richard. He I'll does. Trust me, he does. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on our Nerve podcast, Hope Beyond Brain Disease. I'm Lee Hatcher. There's a whole host of information and resources at www.sidcog.com sydcog.com.au